Uh, good morning, everyone. We'll just wait a couple of minutes um, more to see uh, if anyone else joins up, and then I'll just introduce our host for the session this morning. Um, so good morning everyone, a couple more people to admit there, and welcome to this session on the introduction to R Markdown, kindly hosted by Matthew Francis, who is a Principal Public Health uh, Intelligence Analyst at PHE. Um, thank you everyone for joining us, we hope you find this session really useful and insightful. If you have any questions throughout the session this morning, do feel free to post them in the chat box there. Um, the facilitator will monitor throughout, um, as will I. Um, and just a reminder to please keep your microphones on mute throughout. And um, I'll also be sharing the link to the conference materials in the chat box there, so everyone will have access. Yep, over to you, Matthew. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Beth, you've saved me uh, introducing myself. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, so this is a gen very gentle introduction to uh, our Markdown. Uh, Markdown uh, can be used to automate reports in Word, PowerPoint, HTML and P uh, PDF, but in this session, we'll just be giving a very gentle introduction to Markdown using Word. So before I start, I'll just share my screen. So uh, the learning objectives today, um, we'll be looking at how to create a simple uh, markdown document, uh, creating formatting in the uh, Word documents in markdown, going through different uh, header types and the formatting, numbered lists and bullet points, uh, how to set in-house documents, which you may have uh, for a uh, publishing, and then working with data then automating the whole process. So setting and working with parameters for automation and then doing batch reporting. So um, generating the same report for many different um, organizations based on different parameters. But before we start, I'd just like to gauge um, who we have on this call. So if you've got a mobile phone or if you open up a new window, um, on the internet. If you could please go to www.menti.com and then when you've entered that, if you could please enter the code 670855. Sorry, I'll just go on to another window where all of those uh, details will be. So the details are here. So www.menti.com 6708855. Sorry, and what's that right here? Uh, it, it was just the thumbs up or a heart option for me but now all of the options of expert intermediate uh, novice are here. So, sorry, thanks. Oh, okay, thank you. I'll go on to the next window then. And uh, <clears throat> thank you.
So predominantly uh, novices, a few what is are, so we'll help you get started. Okay, I've got 24 responses. Let's get up to 25 and I'll move on. No, I've got 25 responses. Okay, so uh, yeah, excellent. Thank you. So this is an introduction to uh, our markdown. So I just want to see. Um, oh, but hopefully by the end of the next uh, two to one half hours, hopefully uh, nobody will be scared of our markdown. It's I'll show you how simple it is to use. Glad that at least a few have uh, tried to open it. <laughs> so I think there are 25 before, I'll just wait for one or two more to come in. Okay, thank you. And then, um, depending on how we get on, there may be a bit of deep liable before we even think. Okay, so if you have dabbled. A fair few watts. Okay, this is really uh, helpful. Okay, right. So, yeah, we'll. I think that is the last question. Okay, so. Uh... We'll get started. So um, the content in this module has been uh, written to assume a no prior knowledge of R. So we're going through the basics right from the beginning of R, mark R Markdown. And this course has been set up uh, so that uh, there is some text. So if is everybody connected to rstudio.cloud? So if you could connect to rstudio.cloud, please. And then in the, so I'm just trying to I've closed the videos. Down the right hand in the um, file window, there should be an R markdown script. So can everybody see my uh, desktop? Can everybody see what I'm seeing? Yeah, you should be yeah, my disk, um, screen is here. So I'll just wait while everybody just gets into our studio and opens up a script called our markdown script. So I'll just try and get back into Zoom. I can't see any thumbs up, so I can't see if everybody's got a... Uh... Right, okay, so I'm going to go as uh, slow as I can. 
if I uh, start going too fast, do please slow me down. Or if I'm going too slow, tell me to speed up. Um, this is the first time I've tried to uh, deliver markdown training over the internet. Usually this would be a classroom setting. So please do bear with me. And as I say, it may or may not take up the whole two hours. Uh, for those who have just joined, um, these are the learning objectives. So we're gonna go right through from the basics. So creating a basic markdown document, looking at formatting, headers, different font types, and then we'll be working with data and then batch automation based on parameters. And in this document, there will be a few exercises on the way. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through and edit this together so that we end up with a script which produces a report with quite a lot of formatting and produces quite a lot of data. So if everybody's up and ready to go, the first thing we are going to do is create a blank document before we come back to. So creating the actual R Markdown is very simple. You simply select File, New File, R Markdown. So that was just simply File, New File, R Markdown. And then on this window, it gives you an option whether you, to create HTML, PDFs, or Word documents. We're going to be working with Word documents, and I'll just show you how this works. So you can give your document a title. You can create the, enter the author name. Then if you select OK, <clears throat> it creates you a blank, um, uh, a markdown script, which looks like this. And now the way that we can get that into Word is to use this knit option here. So if you select the knit drop down, knit to Word, give it um, a file name, um, obviously don't uh, create, um, use a different name to what's already listed in the document list, which we'll be working with shortly. So I'm just gonna call that intro. Then if you select save, Now, because we're using RStudio, you have to download the file. So wait for that to download. And there you are, you get a simple introduction to our document. And this is pre-populated in the R Markdown, but that is how simple it is to create the actual Markdown script. So I'll close that go back into the window. So that's how to actually create the document. In this script here, I've already created the um, document and we're gonna go through and edit this together and add in some uh, different formatting and functionality. Sorry, Matthew, I think we have a few plea in the uh, chat box asking to show this again. Um, yeah, of course, yeah. People quite scared of our markdown still. No, absolutely. Uh, thank you for uh, raising that. So we're going to create the, um, the R Markdown document. So to, cre uh, to create the document from scratch, uh, select File, New File, and then the third option down here is R Markdown. Then you can give that a title. So I've already got one called intro. So I'm going to call this intro to. You can enter your author name. So um, I'm going to put 
move, so this is written by me, Matthew Francis. Then you've got options here to um, have your markdown defaulted to HTML, PDF, and Word. So I'm going to select the Word option. Select OK at the bottom. Sorry, is this still too fast? Is everybody keeping up? Select OK. And then this will create a markdown doc, uh, script. And you can see it's got a title, intro to the author and the date. And the output uh, is Word. Now you can simply write that to a Word document using this knit option. So you should be able to see a ball of wool with a needle going through. So we're going to knit this and we're going to knit that to Word. Give this a file name. So I'm going to save this to a Word document called Intro2. And then you'll get a message saying that our markdown is finished rendering. So we can download the file. And we get a Word document. So as, oh, sorry, I forget that people may only have one screen as well. So be flip, um, flicking between the Zoom and your R script. Right. Did everybody man manage to um, Okay, so hopefully everybody's managed to. What's this? Um, sorry, I was just demonstrating how to create the Word document from scratch because as part of the exercise, we're going to be going through and editing a pre existing um, a guide to um, our markdown, which I've written, but I've just stripped it back a bit so we can edit it together and add different functionality to it. Okay, so that's how to create the R Markdown script from scratch. So what we are going to do now, I'm going to close that intro to document. And we are going to work with this pre, uh, R Markdown script, which is in the file window in the bottom right hand side. So if everybody can open this R Markdown script, please, and we can go through and uh, edit this together. So in this example, we will be uh, editing this document and we will be pulling in data from the NHS R datasets package. And so I am going to give this a title, introduction, to our markdown and analysis of RF4. All of this will become clear. The RF4 is simply a hospital code, which we will be working with in editing in this document. But as we go through, we will be um, added, adding different functionality and then finally, automating this based on different parameters. So we have a simple introduction to our markdown. Now, if we knit this, select knit, knit to Word. So we're gonna create a Word document. Now this one we can keep overwriting because we're just updating the same document. So I'm gonna download that file. And there we are. We get a Word document, Introduction to R Markdown and Analysis of RF4 by Matthew Francis on the 29th of October. As you can see, it looks quite bland at the moment. There's no header formatting. Um, it looks quite boring. So the first thing we're going to do 
is explore headers. So the actual headers themselves are controlled from the other document called my template. So if you've ever set up Word documents and templates, this is where you would set the font, what you would want for the different level of headers. So I'm not going to go through that. I'm just going to show how to apply that in um, Markdown. So the first thing we saw was this report was generated on, and then this is the code to generate today's date. But don't worry about that. So I'll just make my window a bit bigger, just so we're uh, just close. So the text here was just all written in the markdown file. So there's nothing um, fancy there. And then for the, I know, uh, sorry, got chats. So I'll just close that again. So formatting in our markdown. So we're going to uh, work with the header levels. So working with the headers is really simple. So if we wanted this to be a chapter header, for example, we would just put a hash in front of it, followed by a space. If we wanted it to be a subheader or a level two header, we'd use two hashes. And so on, so if, we, if it was a third header, we'd use three hashes. And as, as I've said, the different headers have been set up in the reference document, and we will apply those shortly. So simple, uh, sorry, the first exercise here is just to go th um, these headers, which are already here, and so we want to make introduction to markdown and formatting in our markdown a level one header. And the headers in markdown here, so this one here, is a level two header. Then when we do that, we should see the text turn blue. Uh, we haven't got a table of contents yet, so we won't see that populated yet, but we'll go through that shortly. So back to the top. So we, we want to make introduction to markdown a level one header. So we just put a hash in front of that, followed by a space. So that'll give you the uh, level one header. And then we wanted to do the same for the formatting in our markdown. So again, give that a hash, followed by a space. And then the headers, we wanted to make a level two. So if we give that two hashes, followed by a space. So all we have done so far is put a hash followed by a space in front of introduction to a markdown, a hash followed by a space in front of formatting in our in markdown, and then two hashes followed by a space in headers in our markdown. Now, if we go to knit, Knit that to Word. Again, download the file. And then you should see that those um, uh, section head headers have changed. So this is the first level one header. This is a level one header. <coughs> so this is a level two header. Did everybody manage to get that far? Um, can we use comments in our script as we use normally in our R notes? Yes, I will show you how to do that shortly. Um, it looks like everyone. So there you are, you've created your first markdown document and you've applied different header formatters.
and so all of the others are already set up. So the next section is working with italics and bold text. Again, this is uh, quite simple uh, to implement. If for any text that we want to appear in italics, we use one asterisk either side of that word or phrase. And for anything that we want in bold, we use a double asterisk either side of the word or phrase. And so this next exercise, we're just going to make some italic text and bold text. So remember for italic, we just use asterisk either side of that sentence. So we're just going to make that and you should see the um, phrase or word or sentence that you want to make a italic turn blue. And then if we want to make this one bold, it's a double asterisk either side of the um, sentence. And you can actually combine these so you can have bold italics. So if you use a triple asterisk, that will combine the bold, uh, the italics with the bold. And then again, close that off with a triple asterisk. <clears throat> then again, if we knit this to word, Download them, download the file again so that it's written it to a word, and then we can scroll down. So this is where we did the formatting. And then you should see three lots of different texts. You should see some italic, some bold, and some bold italic. They are so applying the formatting in Markdown is really simple. I'll close that document. And is everybody happy with the simple formatting so far? If you want me to go through that, I can slow down and go through again. Or if you're happy for me to proceed, I will proceed. So we've got to reach out. Okay, all good so far. If I'm going too fast, please just do let me know. <clears throat> also in Word documents, we uh, work with bullet points and lists extensively. And again, these are quite um, easy to uh, implement. So for bullet points, we just use an asterisk at the beginning of the uh, sentence sentence followed by a space and again we're going to make this one a bullet point so it's just an asterisk and exactly the same with a numbered list just give it the number which you require followed by a space so this is going to be one two um, Markdown's quite clever, so if you do forget what number you're up to, if you put a number, um, it should just automate it for you. So what this should return is three bullet points, numbers one, two, and three. So I'll just check the chat. And again, if we knit that, We'll download the file. And we can scroll down and see the effect. That, um, so we should see that we've got two bullet points. And then three numbered items. So even though we called this one number five, um, it will change it two or three.
So bullet points and lists in Markdown, very easy to implement. Everybody okay with that? If for some reason, weird reason I wanted to, can you override that function? I know you can in HTML and PDF. I'm not sure in Word and uh, PowerPoint. It's just that uh, HTML and PDF have had some extra packages written for them to help uh, with different functionality. Okay, paragraphs. Um, so need to be careful with uh, Markdown. It's just when you get to the end of a sentence, if you want to start a new paragraph, you need to use a double space at the end of it. Otherwise, it won't create a new paragraph. It'll just create a new sentence. And something else which I've not written into this document is you can actually enter a block paragraphs or quotes. So if you use the greater than sign and then just write a random paragraph, With a double space. Then we can knit to Word. Again, download the file. We can scroll down. Oh, I've not set the reference document yet. And here is where we. Um, use the greater than sign to indent a block quotation. So, so far we've just gone over the basic formatting of the text, uh, creating the different header levels, setting bold text and italic text. Is there anything you'd like me to go over again or happy for me to move on to the exciting stuff where we start setting different uh, temp uh, templates? Okay, so hopefully that was a very gentle introduction to the actual formatting of the text. So quite often when working with uh, Word, you'll have in-house templates um, to work with for publishing. In this example, I've set one called my template. So we can open that and you can just see it's got the R logo at the top and the R mark, the markdown logo at the bottom. So this is what we're going to apply to the document, uh, which we are currently working with in editing. So if you scroll all the way back up to the top, this section here between the uh, dashed lines is where we control uh, different aspects to apply to the whole document. So we've already got an output that we want to apply it to a Word document. Now, we want to, so I'll, I'll delete that because, so on the first indent on the second line, we want to set a word document. So I'm just changing the, uh, and then it will indent it automatically. So to set a reference template, you simply type the command reference doc. Then we will apply a, a colon to say that something will follow. And then we call this my 
template dot doc x. So right at the top, our output is going to be a Word document followed by colon one. So that means that another command is going to follow. We're going to set a reference document, and this is my template. So hopefully you could be able to take the script away and then apply your own branding to the document. So again, if we go to knit, knit to Word, it'll run through. We will download the file. And then you should see this applied. So you should see that the fonts changed because this is the header font that we tried sent to set in the template document. And of course, we weren't working with the te template document before. So the numbering's changed. So I'll just make sure that I've not lost anybody there. Yeah, the cheat sheets are really useful. Mine didn't work. Mm, that didn't work for me. Okay, let's go through that again. You have to um, so this is right at the top. After the date command, we've got output all lowercase, followed by colon. And then <laughs> it should indent it automatically. So we have word underscore document followed by colon. Uh, make sure that there aren't any spaces after the colon. Then if you press return there, it will indent it automatically. So we type in reference underscore doc colon, followed by a space. Then we're using my template dot doc x exactly as it's spelt out here. Yeah, it won't work until you've got the indents. <laughs> so I'll go through that again because I'm going to delete that whole section. So we have output followed by colon, press return, and it will indent it automatically. Then we are going to set a reference doc followed by space. And then we're going to call that my template dot doc x exactly as it's um, printed in the uh, my template docx in the uh, file window. Then we'll go to, so I sort of indented that. Then we'll go to knit, knit to word. Now this isn't going to work because I didn't do the indents right. The joys of life coding. Uh, word document. So it is, we're going to set the reference doc. So the indents um, gone automatic at that time. I'm going to set that to my template dot doc x then we're going to knit that to word and then it should print to the uh, template file Um, why are we specifying again? Because you can have different um, uh, output types. So in there, you could specify that you wanted it to HTML. Yep. 
you could either to uh, PowerPoint or PDF and say, you just tell him mark down the file type that you want to print it to. Yes, if there are formatting of edits and tables, whatever you've uh, built in the template should be applied to the text that we've uh, written in Markdown. And could not fetch resource. Ah, yeah, that is, we'll come to that shortly. I did that on purpose and it's purely that we've told Markdown that we want to import something, but we've not specified what we want to import. Output created our markdown script. I'm getting this error. Yeah, we'll come to that shortly. As long as it's uh, built you a markdown report, uh, don't worry about that. Uh, I think the page numbers you need to set up in the reference document. You can set page numbers when working with HTML and PDF. So as everybody managed to get a reference document, so just be careful with the indentation because uh, um, it, our markdown can be a little bit fickle. But once you've got it set up, you can just do a copy and paste job whenever you uh, create one of these documents. If everybody's happy, we can move on to... So we've... Oh... Also, we've talked about the uh, table of contents as well. So while we're, we are here, we can set a table of content. So we can TOC underneath the reference doc, again, followed by colon. And we just set that into yes, we want a table of contents. And we can also specify the depth based on the number of headers that we have. So I've set table of contents to yes, and I want the depth to be one. So I only want to include the level one headers. So again, we can create, get, knit that to Word. Download the file. You need to enable the editing in order for the table of contents to appear. And there we should see all of the level one headers appear in the table of contents. Did so again, TOC colon space yes without a space afterwards. Then we can set the table of content uh, TOC depth colon one, then see what happens if you set that to two. So So I'm going to set that to two now. And I'm going to knit that to Word again. Enable editing to allow the uh, changes to take effect. And then we should see the uh, subheaders at level two appear under those level one headers. I don't think I put in any level three headers in the document. But you could, uh, if you had level three, you could uh, set those in um, to output into the table of contents as well. So did everybody manage to set a table of contents? I didn't get TOC in Roman numerics. Uh, I think that's just the way it was set in the document. I didn't get an option to enable editing. That. So just make sure that when you um, enter TOC colon space yes, there's no space after the yes. Okay, it works now. Right, once you get into the swing of Markdown, it soon becomes, uh, you, um, you soon just table of contents, but no actual table, SFTOC. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you. So we'll come on to any um, troubleshooting shortly. So we've got table of contents. So um, we've got different headers. We've got some formatting in there. So the document is slowly coming together. Then what we also want to do when uh, automating Word documents is we may want to pull in uh, data. So I'm just going to, so here we are, up to about row 99, depending on how much um, spacing you've added. So we're going to be working with data. So working with data, we can import data just like we would into an R script by setting up an R chunk. And this is where Noor asked that question about if we can annotate our code. So to set up a, um, a code chunk, this won't appear in the final output, as long as we tell it not to appear. We use three back ticks. So th these are the um, ticks up in the left hand side of a standard keypad. Now it's not a comma. Don't know the number of uh, troubleshooting we've had to do uh, with um, entering commas instead of the uh, back ticks. So it's the back tick up in the left hand side, followed by the curly bracket, then you should see everything below go gray. And then you type R to say that this is a, a code chunk. And then we can call this anything we want. So I'm going to call this one code C. It's just a code chunk which we can reference. And now the echo, if we set that to true, it will appear in the um, uh, documents. We don't want that, so we can set that to false. Then, just as we would in the standard R script, we can annotate the code using the ash. Then, this is how to set up a chunk. And then we close it off again by using three back ticks. So then we could do any um, data importing or calculations in here. So for example, we could take the variable A and assign a, valuable, a value of one. So for those who are new to R, this is just uh, an assignment. So we're just um, creating an object called A and we're assigning a value of one. So whenever we see A again, it would print one. Now there are different op um, options for the code chunk. So if we use this cog here, click on. So this tells Markdown what to print into the Word document. So we can turn off the warnings. We don't want to see any warnings when we print it. We don't want to see any messages. If we apply that, so that just means that if there were warnings or messages um, in any of the analysis, if there were errors, it wouldn't print those to the Word document. Uh, okay, the cog bit. So I will go through that again. I, I do appreciate that. Some only have um, one screen or a laptop and it's quite difficult to follow what's going on, Zoom and coding at the same time. So we're going to set up a code chunk, which is where we can um, do analysis, uh, manipulate data, pull in data, etc. And to set up the code chunk, we just use the uh, triple back tick. So that's the key in the top left hand side of the uh, keypad. So we just want three of them. Then we open a curly bracket, and this is going to be some R code. I call mine code C. And then as per other text, we can annotate what's going on.
and then we can close it off again with a triple back tick. Now we can send different commands to this. Um, so when this prints to Word, if there were any errors in the calculations, we may not want to see them in the final output. So we can turn the warnings off. If there are any messages, such as the loading of packages, etc., we can turn those off because we don't want them to appear in the final Word document. Click Apply. And now if there are any messages or warnings uh, in this R script, it wouldn't return to the final Word document. Um, I'm not sure about the white space in here. I'm not sure. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure about the uh, the spaces in here, but the if you uh, select the cog, that will set up everything as it should be anyway. Just make sure that. So that's how to set up a code chunk, and we'll be working with these as we go through. And so there was an example of how to set up a code chunk. And now we're going to return some data. So in this exercise, we've got a code chunk here and we've set the library NHSR data sets. So we're going to be working with the uh, NHSR data sets. And at the moment, it doesn't return any data. So we're going to use some different functions to uh, print the top six records of the AE attendances data set. And so we'll work through this together. So we're going to create an object called top six using the function head. So we're just going to call this data set top six. And then we're going to use the assignment option and we're going to pull some data into the Word document. And to get this, we simply use the function head. So head returns the top six records of a data set. The tail would return the bottom. And the table we are working with is AE attendances. And then we can print the top six to the Word document. So if we just select print, top six, then we can knit that to Word. So if we scroll down, we should see here that we've got the top six references printed to the Word document, the um, top six records printed to the Word document. <laughs> it doesn't look great, but we'll go onto the table formatting shortly. But basically, for if you're used to writing R and manipulating data, it's the code chunk where you would perform those actions and return the results into the Word document. So did everybody manage to print some data into the Word document? So yes, me too. I think a five to 10 minute break. Oh, I didn't. Okay, we'll go through that shortly. Yeah, I'll repeat that. So in this code chunk here, so we'll do this and then we'll have a five minute break too, where we... So we loaded the library NHSR data sets. Then all we've done is said that we want to create um, a data set called top six. And this is gonna consist of the um, head of the AE attendances data. So it's AE underscore attendances. And so we're pulling this out of the NHSR data sets and the head function returns the top six records of any data set. 
And then we just said that we want to print top six. Error in pass. Ooh. Not sure whether I uh, should sure the route. Okay, I'm missing the comma. Uh, so we've got the only functions we've added are that we want to print top six and print. So all of this correct code, all of the code will be available in another one of the uh, scripts. So we should have all of the answers to work with if, uh, if it's not working at the moment. So. So shall we call a five minute break there? Okay, if we come back uh, just after 11 o'clock and we can um, carry on. I'll, I'll keep clicking back to where people on the chat were. Yeah, um, when this script was set up, it was set up so that the only thing that we'd, have, we'd need to add would be the extra functions. So if there are all of the settings for the uh, code chunks should already be uh, set up throughout the document. So if there are any issues, I oh, do apologize. So, we got as far as pulling in some data from the AE attendances and we printed a messy looking table into the Word document. So if we knit that to Word, just check that everybody manages to get a scrappy looking uh, data set printed. And I'll just scroll down, yeah. And everyone, we should get this uh, scrappy looking data, which is the top six records of the AE attendances data set. Okay, I'll go back into the R script, into the R script. So we can also embed results from the uh, code chunk into a Word document. So what we're going to do here is we're going to count all of the records in the AE attend attendances data set. And we're going to print that value into the Word document. So no doubt you have to do this with a, quite a lot of reporting uh, for different geographies, for example. So what we're going to do here is we're going to count the number of records in the AE attendances data set assign it to the value uh, to the object AE count and then we're going to print that to the um, Word document so we can tell the reader how many records there are in the um, AE attendances data set. So we're going to call this AE count then we're going to use the less than minus sign so I get all sorts of pop-ups to assign um, to AE count. Then we're going to count simply the number of rows. So if you want to count the number of records, use the uh, function n row in the AE attendances. So created a variable AE count, and we're just counting the number of rows in the AE attendances data set. So we'll ignore that next part for now. We'll come back to that shortly. 
And so what we want to do at the moment, the word document just states there are X records in the AE attendances data set. We don't want it to say X, we want it to state whatever this value is here, which we're going to uh, count. So this will result in one value. And so we simply pass this into the uh, Word document. So we'll delete the X. We'll use the back tick. Then say that an R function is going to follow. And then the variable we created is simply called AE underscore count. Then we'll close that off again with a back tick. Then you should see that uh, turn a different, like a dark navy blue. So uh, just go over that again. So what we're going to do, create a variable called AE count, which is the number of rows in the AE attendances data set. Then we're going to turn the, um, inform the reader of the document how many records are on the uh, data set by passing that value into the word document here. So it's just a back tick R and then simply uh, pass this variable name into uh, the paragraph and close it with a back tick. And so if we select knit, knit to word, then we will download the file again. And here, just, before, just below the uh, scrappy looking table, we should get a paragraph. There are 12,765 records in the AE attendances data set. And so that's how easy it is just to pass values from um, the uh, code chunk into the actual Word document, which we want the reader to see. Yeah. Did everybody manage to uh, do that? Did we get any uh, encounter any errors there? Yep, I'll go over that again. So I'll uh, delete that bit. Place that with X, how it was. So what we are doing, um, for those who have not used uh, functions like this in that before, to count the number of records in the data set, we use the function en row, and that just counts the number of records. And we're going to count the number of records in the AE attendances data set. And we're going to assign that to a variable called AE count. However, this is in a code chunk, which we have turned off, so the reader won't be able to see this code chunk. So we're going to pass this value into a paragraph in the Word document, which the reader will be able to see. To do that, we use a back tick, as we uh, did when setting up the code chunk. Then we just type R to say that some type of R function is going to follow. And then pass the variable name, AE count, into the Word document. Then we're going to knit that to Word. Then we'll scroll down to where that scriptful looking table was. Then we should see a sentence. There are 12,765 records in the AE attendances data set. Just close that. Okay, how can we make sure that this is the correct value? Oh, you'd add whatever QA checks you would you'd normally use into the code chunk just to make sure, or you could open up a separate R script just to do an investigation of the AE attendances data. And that just returned a value without any commas. It wasn't formatted. So this, this is the type of function that you could use to add um, commas in. 
and this is already set up so all we need to do is add in the uh, back tick either side of this function so there are then before the r enter a back tick and then after the last bracket enter another back tick and then if you run that document you should see it print the value again uh, comma separated now there is an exercise um, instead of counting the number of rows we want to count the number of fields so how many fields have we got available in the uh, a e attendances data set <coughs> so, so this is already set up so we're going to call this value sorry if i'm going too fast just let me know and i'll slow down okay so we're going to do exactly the same but instead of using rows we're going to use columns we're going to count the number of fields which are available in the ae attendances data set so we are going to call this ae what do we call it ae fields fi fields again we're going to use the same assignments but instead of rows we're going to use ncol and we're going to count the number of columns in the ae tendencies data so again once you've done the calculation in the code chunk you can pass that value into the word document and i've already yeah that's already been set up so all we need to do is either side of the r AE fields, which is what we uh, call that variable. So we're going to count the number of columns, pass it into the Word document. And again, we can knit that to Word. Enable editing, so really scroll down. And so when we should see that we've got 12,765 records. Then we entered that function to make sure it was a uh, comma separated. And we only have six fields in the AE attendances data set. But we've got to count them in the table there. So is everybody with me so far? Hopefully uh, this is all making sense. <coughs> I'm not going too fast. Um, okay, I mentioned a bit on the dplyr, so we're gonna do a bit of a manipulation. I'm keeping up, oh, thank you, thanks for letting me know. So dplyr is a package um, available in R and it just um, enables us to um, format data a lot easier. And there are five key functions available. So we can use select. So for those who have ever used um, SQL, the select in dplyr works in exactly the same way. So you can return particular variables in, an or in a particular order from a data set. We can apply filters, we can generate summary functions, we can mutate data sets by adding new variables, and we can order the data set in different ways. Um, so just going to use a very quick example of dplyr in this exercise. So what this function is doing, we are going to create an object called organization, orgs, sorry, from the A attendances data set, which is what we were working with above. And then this percentage greater than percentage, um, also known as pipe, this states that a function is going to follow. So we're going to use this data set and a function will follow. And what we're going to do is generate 
a summary. So we're going to summarize and we're going to create a field called org, which is the number of distinct organization codes in the AE attendances data set. So we're just calculating how many unique organization codes are in the AE attendances data set. So in this exercise, we're going to find the total number of attendances in the data set. Uh, so the uh, function that we're going to, so we're going to create an object called a at, so that's attendances. It's going to be based on the AE attendances. So we're going to derive some calculations from here. Again, we're going to summarize. So we're going to create uh, some summary statistics. And our attendance total, so the at total, will be equal to the sum of the field called attendances. So within the AE attendances, there's a field called attendances, and we're just going to summarize that across the whole of the data set. Then we can generate the average number of attendances just by deleting the hash key. So our average attendances will be the this value here, the at underscore total divided by the orgs, or so that's going to be a count of the number of organizations. And then again, we can pass that value into the Word document. So what this is going to say is that there are however many unique organization codes in the AE attendances data set with a total number of attendances. So just put in the back ticks around the R and the object and however many attendances there were, uh, average number of attendance. So we're just generating some summary statistics based on the data that we have available. So I will knit that to Word. And again, it should print values out into the Word document. Which is up here. So there are 274 unique organization codes in the AE attendances data set with a total of, and then it gives us the scientific notation for the numbers because the numbers are quite big. So I'll go back. And that is where this function helps. So what this will do is re report this as a number rather than as a scientific number. So if you wanted to gain, it should give you the correct value in millions. So again, all we've done is calculated some summary statistics just to get used to passing values into the Word document. And there are lots of other calculations we could do. So uh, finding the organization code with the most attendances. And they, um, these calculations are already set up. So this would go through the AE attendances data set and then aggregate which and then return the code for the hospital with the most attendances. And there's another exercise there to return the minimum number of breaches. But I think all, all I think with the uh, time, I think we'll pass on the exercise seven because uh, I think we're going to be wanting to set up parameters. I think this is what we're really interested in now. So the actual automation aspect for different organization codes. So before we go on,
Uh, hi, no, yes. So all we did was calculated some summary statistics. Sorry, I'll clear that. Some summary statistics based on the AE attendances data set, just to get used to passing values from a code chunk into the Word document. So it wasn't that one, it was this one. So all we did was we calculated the number of uh, unique organization codes in the AE attendances. And then we calculated the total number of attendances in the AE attendances data set and assigned it a value at. Then we created a variable called average attendances, which was the total number of attendances divided by the number of organizations to get an average attendance per organization. And then that returns some probable numbers in scientific notation. And so that's why we have this function here options psi pen equals 100 and then this will return the um, number as a number in millions rather than in scientific notation and then we just pass these values into the word document so it's just repeating what we did before we're just getting used to passing um, values from the code chunk into the word document and so now we're going to set up parameters so in the AE attendances data, so I'll just scroll up to the top again. We said that this is going to be an introduction to R markdown and analysis of hospital code RF4. But we can actually make this value anything we want it to be. Oh, sorry, I should have. So org, dollar org with the dollar sign. Okay, sorry, I should have explained. I'll scroll, so I'll just go back a step, I'll scroll down. So we've cre created so when we created these objects here, we created a sorry, yeah, here. We created a object called at in this example. So this would create a data frame or table called at. And within there, it would create a field called at underscore total. And I don't know if you're used to um, other programming languages, but the way that we um, Call, recall that value or that column of data is to use at to call the um, data frame name dollar and then at underscore total to, to uh, select a field name. Does that make sense? Like in SQL, you might do table dot field name. In R, it's uh, data frame dollar field name. And it's just purely how we uh, call data. Yeah, thank you. That's a brilliant idea. So in the console, I'll add this to notes to the next time I do this. Within the console, I type that wrong. You, we can see what's in the data. I've been looking at this too long.
Yeah, um, I think I will add into the uh, notes. So if we do this in future, go through and uh, look at the actual data set itself. It's purely the way that we uh, select the data. Uh, I'll set the line in, NHSR, data sets. We can set the library NHSR data sets, and then we can use view, AE, tendencies. And there we are. So yeah, thank you for everyone who commented on that. So yeah, so if you set the library for NHSR data sets, the console, then you can select view AE underscore attendances. So we can see what's in there. Um, we can see that we've got uh, six fields, which we knew because we counted them in the exercise earlier. So we've got the period, the OR code. So this is the element of the report, which we are going to automate now. <laughs> and then there are other attributes for each organization code. So this is where I was talking about the RF4 at the beginning of the um, an hour and a half ago when we started our adventure into NHS Markdown and we set a title called RF, RF4. And now we are going to automate this. So right at the top of the document, which is where we set the title and the output, so above the title, we can declare a set of parameters. So these are values which we would like to automate and pass into the document. <laughs> so it's params, colon, uh, no space. And we are going to set our first parameter and call it org. And in the first example, we're going to work with RF4. And while we're at it, we can set another parameter and we're going to call that show code. And we're going to set that to false and we'll use that shortly. So all we've done is right at the top of the document, set a set of parameters called the first one org, colon, and we've set it to RF4. And the second one is show code, colon, and we've set that to false. Now we've set up these parameters, we can actually pass these into the uh, Word document. So this RF4 here, we can delete that. Again, use a backtick. And then lowercase, so we're working with R. Then we're going to call the params which we've uh, set at the top, dollar org, because that's what we called that variable name. So we've assigned org the value of RF4, but all we need to do now is throughout the document, wherever we want RF4 to appear, we can just use this syntax here, backtack r params dollar org, backtick. So if we knit that, to Word. That value of RF4 has been automated into the header. Did everybody get that? Would you allow me to go through that again? Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Paul. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've set up the first parameter. So we're working with this RF4. So let's see where we're up to. Uh, 
And so we can scroll down. And then around. Yes, I'll show you how to um, do that. We'll come on to that shortly. So we're setting up. The, we're slowly automating the document. We're slowly automating the document. Uh, it took a snag or two on the way there, but I'll rectify. Um, and we are up to working with parameters. And we've set the parameter to set at the top. So we've set the params and org. And so at the moment in the word document, that will print analysis of our params org simply because we haven't put the back ticks around that. So now, whenever we run this, this will print analysis of, and then whatever we set the org value to in the um, parameters. So I'll just knit that just to uh, demonstrate what that's doing. And so here we've got analysis of RF4. That's the value that we set in the um, parameters up at the top. But we haven't set this bit here yet, purely because we haven't put the back ticks around it. So we can go through and start editing this now. So we're going to do a bit of analysis and we're going to focus on hospital, whatever we've set in the parameters. And then we can also pass that parameter value into any functions. So, for example, this organization or total for the AE attendances, at the moment, that will only um, filter on the org code, which is called RF4. But we want this to be automated. We want it to filter on whatever we set that value to in the parameters. So here, we simply change that to params dollar org because that's what we name the variable in the parameters. So now if we set this to a different organization code in the parameters at the top of the document, it will automate to whatever we call that organization field. And it will run all of those calculations. And so in the AE attendances data set, then it will count the number of attendances for this organization code, because that's what we've decided to filter on. And we can just set the back tick around that because we took them out. And then there's just some extra code here to set the minimum and maximum of the periods. And again, in this code chunk around row 266, we want this to be automated. So it will run whatever we call that or code. And then it will um, generate the month. Okay, so there's a little exercise here. So we're at exercise nine now. So we've reformatted the month data. And what we want to do is rewrite this sentence. So we know what the minimum month is and the maximum month. And we're gonna count the total number of attendances between those two months. So again, around this, we've got params dollar org. So that will set to RF4 and we just need to um, replace X 
and y with the minimum and the maximum uh, org month. So this is org. Sorry, I'll just pick up the chat. Yes. So that percentage y percentage month is what sets the date to the month year format. So we're just taking the date period, setting it as y uh, year month. And then we want to call in the minimum and maximum months. So remember, we want to use a oh, use the back tick followed by R. And then we're going to now, so far, we've been doing all of the calculations in the code chunks and then passing the values into the sentences. Here, you, you can actually, um, if your functions are quite short, you can actually do it on the uh, fly. So all we are doing is setting, um, we want the min, we call this data frame org data. And the field we want is the month. And close it off with a back tick. And why? So we've pulled in the minimum month and now we want the maximum month. So again, we're just going to pass that value into the paragraph. So we want back tick R, and then this time we want the max. Or data. In the month field. So we're just manipulating data and then pulling the values into the um, document. Is so nothing in the chat at the moment. So we will knit that. So this was around exercise nine. Enable the editing. So the table of contents. Uh, I've gone a bit too far. So we set up the parameters, we've done in. And there we are. So exercise nine, the data contain the attendances at RF4 between the months April 2016 and March 2019. And all we've done is replace the X and the Y with functions which pull out the minimum organization month and the maximum organization month. So is everybody up to speed so far? Nothing in the chat. And as you've seen, so we can pass the parameters org into different calculations. We can pull the values into the Word document. Uh, and then there's data about the breaches. Okay, so at the moment we've been working with messy looking um, tables one way around this is to use the uh, cable within NITAR. And so here, what we have done, we've taken the org data, we're grouping by month and admission type, and then we are summarizing the total number of attendances, the total number of breaches, and then the breach percentage, which is the breaches divided by the attendances, and again, I'll just show you if we knit that to Word. So the cable helps you to make um, neater tables. And we'll scroll down. And here you get a neater looking table. So it's got the header. Uh, and it's neatly organized into columns. So the cable function is actually is very useful. I 
I'll just get my window open. Right. Now we are going to be importing. So that's how to uh, import data where, and with the tables. Then sometimes we want to import images. Again, that's very simple. The basic syntax is to use exclamation mark. Then the square brackets allow you to give your image a uh, name. And then within the uh, brackets, you simply write the file path to the image. And so what we're going to do, we're just going to import the hospital PNG image. So if you look down here in the file window, and there's an image called hospital.png. And again, so all we do, exclamation mark, open close brackets. And then this is where you can give your, hosp uh, your image a caption. And then in the uh, normal brackets, we simply find the uh, file path to the image. Of course, this was if this was on a different um, file path, you'd also write in the file path, but we're just pulling in the hospital.png picture from here. Then again, we can knit that to Word. Download the file, enable editing, and just scroll down. And there we should have uh, the picture of the hospital pulled in. So pulling in images is really easy. Is there anybody who didn't manage to pull in the image, or would you like me to go over that again? So I'm just keeping an eye on the uh, chat. So, oh, God. Okay, so hopefully, seeing that working with Markdown isn't all that daunting, and it's quite easy to set up different attributes. Now, when we so this is yes. So any when working with images or pictures or anything else you want to import, it's normally helpful to have them all saved in the file in the same file location where you've got your project set up and all your scripts. Otherwise, you end up having to pull them in from different folders, and it can get quite messy. And so I'll just can you link to a web image? Can you also bring TIFF? I'm not sure about PDF documents. You can print you can set up your markdown to print directly to PDF. Um yes, you can link to any images on the web exactly the way that we've um, just set them up with the uh, file locations. Uh, so I'm just going to knit that again to Word. Uh, and you should my, the document as it is, is fairly, uh, not very clear. So we've got all of the warning messages. So we've got the warnings, the messages and everything. And we want to turn those off because we don't want those printed to the final report. Oh, just, so I've been talking for nearly two hours now, my throat's getting a bit dry. <laughs> 
So up here, we set a parameter called show code. And we could use that throughout the document. So where we've got our code chunks. Uh, sorry, what the first one is. So we've got our message equals false, warning equals false. Uh, we could go through the entire document and set all of these to false. Or We should be able to set everything in the setup. And so it's turned off all of the warnings and the messages. So we've nearly got a tidy document to work with. And so that was set up here in this NITAR options chunk set. We can set the echo to false, the message to false, and the warning to false. So that should be applied all the way through the document. And then I think the last element is you can see that I've written this very iter iteratively and the exercise numbers have gone all out of sync. So we've got multiple exercises, seven. Yeah, so there's one exercise, seven. One, another exercise, seven. Uh, I guess this is a... Oh, there was a solution. Can you think of, could you think of a way of how this could be automated? I think I've given a clue there. So the way I would tackle this, so I've set a, um, a value n and I've signed it the value of zero and the way I would deal with this is wherever I've got an exercise so that was exercise oh, sorry where's the first thing there we got exercise so we've set a variable I would set that to n which we've already set to zero and I'd add one to it and then wherever I've got an exercise number, you could simply use this code and then for every next value of n, it would just add one. And so then all of the values should be in order. <coughs> and then I guess once you get used to Markdown, it becomes, you get used to the uh, handling the errors at the bottom um and then i guess when you've overcome the basics of r and mark, uh, markdown um it becomes more of an aspect of uh, problem solving than getting to grips with the actual document uh, the actual programming language itself um spell check in uh, markdown you simply use this abc here and then that will go through and do all the spell check for you. Uh, there's loads of information on Markdown all over the web. So the cheat sheets, uh, the stack exchange is normally a good place to go for any help. 
there was a question about looping through different organization codes. So we've set this up. So a loop through organization code RF4 or whatever we specify this value to be. And, oh, sorry, no, just check the chat. Uh, at the end of, sorry, the, there is, I'd already loaded it, um, final report RMD. So that's pretty much everything that we've worked through. Sorry, I missed lines 20 to 24 at the top. Ah, oh, okay. So in this section, we want to set off all of the messages and the warnings and the documents. And it's very easy to do this. So we've set up a global option here to apply to the whole document. In fact, we, we've not set this up. When you create a new markdown document, this section is set up automatically and you can apply attributes to this to, throughout the document by clicking on the clock. So you can have your warnings on throughout. So it will show all of your warnings and all of your messages or you can set them all to false. So whatever you set in here will apply to the whole document, not just to this um, code chunk, but to all of the code chunks which you've used in the document. Uh, no. Okay, and then finally there is a file in this window at the bottom called batch report R. So what we want this to do is run for every single organization code. Well, we're not going to do that because there's about 250 of them. But so if we open up the script. Ah, in fact, this is where I will add extra analysis of the NHSR data sets for future so we can investigate it in detail. So this is where we set the live the NHSR data sets we can find all of the unique organization codes in the NHSR data sets. So here we are, we've got 274 of them. Uh, let's say we took the first five. So we're going to look at the first five organization codes. So we only want to look at five rather than every single one of them. And so what we're gonna do now, this amazing report, which we've made here, but only for RF4, we're going to run it for the five organization codes at the top of the document. And that's, ah, oh, so this won't work because this used to be called report without answers, but it's not anymore. It's now called R markdown script. So we're going to apply this function to R. Markdown script. We're going to highlight that code and run. And then what that will do is create reports for the, the um, document for the uh, five organization codes at the top of the script. So that is how you can loop through. So if we wanted, we could have done that to loop through 274 hospital codes, but of course we're not going to do that because that will take quite a while to run. But hopefully that's code which you can take and adapt uh, in your own setting. So running reports, the same report for different geog uh, geographies. Very simple to did. Was there anybody who wasn't able to use that batch report code? It should be quite helpful and intuitive just need to change the uh, script which we're referring to so if you write your own script just change this section here and you should be able to apply it oh sorry that's so untimely sorry i've got can we pause the recording for two minutes we're very nearly there uh, i've just got a delivery to deal with so yes absolutely i'll do that now matthew yes you can add as many parameters as you would like Sorry, I just, you could uh, 
So this is where you call your parameters. So your parameters equals, and then you list them here, separated by comma. And then that would refer to whatever parameters you've set up in the uh, main RMD script for your report processing. <coughs> so um, I think that was everything I was going to cover in this session. And I thought we we're going to be pushing it time, but I think we've just about hit it on time. So if there are any other questions, I mean, I think, Mark, it, it, it's practice, but I think the more you do it, the sooner you get used to it. There's Hopefully this has shown that there's nothing to be afraid of. Once you get used to R and writing script, it's quite easy to uh, generate a Markdown document and hopefully Markdown will change your life and uh, make any for, um, uh, report pr production a lot easier and less time consuming. Well, thank you, Matthew. That was a fantastic session. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, as Matthew said, if you have any questions and want to post them in the chat box, I'll just um, give a minute there for that. Uh, so before we wrap up, because this is the first time we've done it online, so it would be helpful to get uh, a bit of feedback about how that went. I mean, open to any criticism. I am married with two kids, so I get criticism all the time. Yes. I will also post a link to a survey that you can complete on um, SurveyMonkey. And um, as Matthew said, any feedback you have would be really useful. Yeah, I, think I, did, I did skim over quite a lot in the, uh, I think that's uh, possibly assumption about prior knowledge of R and possibly adding a bit more detail around some of the functionality and formatting. I try to concentrate it as much as I could on Markdown, R Markdown rather than R. Well, if anything, any other additional information, I think my email address is on the, uh, I think it's certainly on the Zoom link. So please get in touch if there's anything else I can help with. Where would you be your recommendation to use Art Markdown for automation? I think in the past, there's been quite a lot of repetitive uh, producing reports for like multiple local authorities on a certain on a monthly basis. So Markdown definitely, it's weighing up the balance between what do you want to automate and where would it be quicker just to do it manually. And there's certainly been lots of uh, occasions where we've had monthly reports from multiple organizations and using an automated process like this, it just saves you time to focus on other areas. Okay, thank you for those 15 responses. Uh, sorry, just a couple more questions. I'm I'll just trying to get back into this. How would you vote over? Actually, how would you rate the session overall, please? And I guess I should, should have caught uh, feedback about uh, the, way, the workbook method. I thought, I thought it'd be helpful to have a workbook to uh, build together rather than just working from a blank script and just writing a... Okay, right, thank you. Hope to have a... Uh, yeah, I think this bit would uh, be very helpful because um, I think um, there'll be uh, an ask to do this a few more times. So if anything was done differently, uh, what do you think could have been done differently? I think this is a open... I think this has got profanity filters, so...
Yeah, maybe pace with yeah, okay. Yeah, so the PowerPoint, I think it was a case of where you know whether to put PowerPoint on Word, and I thought Word was a bit. Ah, oh, yeah, I didn't uh, skip graphs. I think that's make it half an hour to an hour longer. <laughs> I'll have to make sure I've stocked up plenty of water. Okay, I'll pull, I'll pull something together for PowerPoint as well. PowerPoint, it's not greatly different to producing it for Word. Repeat each exercise, thank you. Yeah, PDF. Yeah, but I'll try and add in other packages for producing plots. Uh, thank you for that, it was very helpful. Uh, how do you feel now? I think this is the last one. <laughs> Hopefully you feel like you're on top of the mountain about to change the world. So we know what, what was uh, the, the, the documents where we, we know about all of these symbols. Ready for a coffee, ditto. Thirsty, me too. Well, hopefully it was a useful two hours. I think that's everything. So thank you for joining. Thank you for listening for me for two hours. Thank you for being engaging. I hope it was useful. That's my email address, should you need to get in touch for any information. Okay, well, yeah. thank you again, Matthew, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, hopefully um, you'll get involved with other art workshops that we have running. <laughs>